ymchwilio rhwng sut y cyfan a chwech gwella mae pitocrwydd y siop hepatig yn cael ei ddydd i'w droi cyn ail ddenu'r ysgolheigydd i'r ffordd wrth i gael ei gysylltu www.hepatig.org o bysgota mae rhai ffrwythau siop hep o ôl eu cyfarfod yn cael eu cymryd yn seiliedig ar y web Dr. Pecan yn ffwrdd o'r ffwrdd o'r ffwrdd Dr. Pecan yn ffwrdd o'r 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 Of write the correct data to a file to your machine. It uses a file to file format, such as something like a binary or a CSV, which can be read by virtually all data preparation and analysis languages, including Microsoft Excel and Office 365. Open Sesame uses a plugin architecture that allows for easy integration with other equipment, such as the iLib eye tracker for SR reports and the Siri response for SR bots and Pinged Siri. Finally, if you know how to program using the Python language, you can easily insert Python code into speech Rabbit to do pretty much anything. In this tutorial, we'll take a look at the general usage of Open Sesame and how you can implement a simple experiment in the program. Let's begin by taking a tour of the equipment. This is the main interface of Open Sesame, which comprises of four main panels, and we'll take a look at each of these panels in turn. The first panel is the main toolbar that you'll bump into in the Sesame window, which comprises a series of icons that allows you to show data preparation to your Sesame program. We'll take a look at each of these grouping methods in turn. The first group deals with basic file formats, such as creating a new script, opening a script, or saving the final script to work on, or a script. These three options work exactly the same way as they would do in any other Sesame program. The next three icons allow us to present a script. We have three choices, we can run full screen, such as we would normally run our experiment, but we can also choose to run the experiment in a window if we wish. We can also perform a quick select as well, which is basically getting the experiment up quite quickly and then going to the test screen to see if it works smoothly. The next three icons deal with Open Sesame panels. Every time you open up a new object in the Open Sesame window, it will create a new tab in the tab area for that particular object. Now, because we've only got a small experiment and we can only do two or three of the uh, ten objects, it's not too bad that we can't actually read the full experiment in its entirety in the window in turn. However, if you've got quite a large experiment and you can't actually present the first few objects in there, it can become quite annoying if it is all those different tabs open. So, these two options allow us to actually deal with these tabs a little bit better. The first thing we can do is close all the other tabs. Essentially, what this would do is close every other tab apart from the select one. So you could have had, say, 20 tabs open, the select one would click and close every time, and it would close the other nine tabs with it, which would then close the select one. We can also prevent Open Sesame from opening up multiple tabs in the first place by selecting them each time. This way, whenever you open up a new object, it will just be placed in the tab that you want. Personally, I quite like to use this because it shows up as a little icon for me. If it is a personal preference, you don't have to use this one. I like using all of them because they're all very similar to what Open Sesame is. The next three icons will show or hide various windows within the main interface. The first will show the file pool, which allows us to add pictures and files to our experiment. The second will show variable inspector, which lets us set a range of variables, particularly useful if you're in the Sesame Kitchen and you want to set measures for something, which we quite often like to do in tutorials and scripts. And the last one will show the debug rule, particularly useful if you're setting the experiment to some session for some reason, you can't figure out why, or if you're using some inline Python code, which is very useful for that as well. The debug rule is something that uh, you really like to have put in when you're setting up your uh, script. The final two icons deal with Open Sesame characteristics. Two straightforward options, one for offline help, which is basically sites that have visual interfaces and simulation, and the online help, which is actually text support and text editing for your uh, Sesame Rabbit or Sesame Kitchen app as well. The next panel we'll look at is the item toolbar. The item toolbar contains a series of icons which will represent different items for different types of experiments. For example, we could have a remove icon, which would close the different types of files, which could have a reject icon, which would close the different types of files, which would open up the different types of files and so on. 
these are blocks in the building. So, so let's go to look at a few overview blocks. It contains the outline of our design layout. So, by default, this is the full template. We have the sort of view experiment, which is the experiment object. And if we click on that object, you'll see in the tab area, we've got these details of the blocks that we've drawn. Click on that color. Uh, we also have, then have a sequence of objects. So we have the sequence object contains a list of blocks and objects that can be run to run our experiment. So if we try to run this experiment, for example, it will actually do nothing in the special style field box. It will actually create that for us. Um, so it's a little bit tough to organize it like this, but it would run the blocks in the order that we draw them to be on the screen. In this particular case, we have blocks that we've actually drawn in order. So if we um, click on creation, click on sequence, we have the blocks that that looks like. Creation is quite a complex object so it's a good idea to click on Create because it will help you to create the blocks. To finalize the layout we have the tab area which is the layout of our blocks. It's basically where we do our main work inside of those blocks. For example we find the cells and the um, sort of text box and so on. So that's a picture of the interface. Let's have a look now at the experiment that we can actually implement on the interface. So let's take a look at the experiment we're going to implement on the first day of session. It's quite a straightforward experiment where we're going to present the participants with pictures of cat faces, which we've got on the screen at the moment, and ask them to make a decision about whether they think that cat is male or if they think that cat is female, or indeed vice versa. We'll indicate their responses by pressing one of two keys on the keyboard. And so we get them to describe if they think the male cat is male, or if they think the cat is female. This will actually then run with a female. This is the general structure of the experiment. We have simple two instructions to begin with, which is what we're going to do after all. We then present them with a floating point on a blank screen, and then we present the pictures of the cat face on the blank screen. Now the fixation point on the blank screen might be set for a particular duration, we may say 500 milliseconds per day. But we'll have the picture of the cat face on the screen until the time runs out. Finally at the end of the experiment we click on thank you, which is a thank you token for the experiment participants. Now of course, this can only display one particular cat face, but we've actually managed to display multiple cat faces. So we're going to actually run through this particular instruction exercise for the number of cat faces that we want to display. We'll do that for 10 or 20 cats, and we'll have one female. Now, this is one way of drawing our cat faces, cat faces. But if I just rotate the experiment to be 90 degrees, I can just plot it slightly differently. So now we've got the instructions, the first object on the list, followed by the experiment, which will take some time to form, and then the thank you icon at the end. We can think of this as being the global structure of the experiment. Beyond the global structure of the experiment, we actually have what takes place during the main experiment itself. In this particular case, it's the quite straightforward free object that we've designed to run on the blank screen with the picture of the cat face that we need to draw the test. Now there is a reason behind actually plotting the experiment a particular way. And that is, if you think back to the part in the interface window where we looked at the overview of the blog, you can start to see how there's some similarities between drawing the experiment out this way and the way that the experiment is drawn in the actual overview window. And as we build up the experiment, we can always think back to this particular case to make sure the experiment is being built up in the correct way. So let's now take a look at how actually how we're going to put that experiment together on the first day of session. So here we are back inside our discussion board. When we open it up, we've got the default template opened up, which contains a very simple structure for the experiment. So a sequence, which contains two objects, a special style field note card, and that is where the instructor of welcome to the blog is kept, and all the content is displayed on the blog on the screen. Now I don't need either of these special style field note cards or the welcome structure displayed, so I'm going to delete them out of the experiment. To do this, I can just right click and click on Now, they haven't actually been permanently deleted by default. What I can do is I click on this disclosure star over here on the right arrow. So they're actually sitting down here now on the left side of the instructions window. We can think of the unused items as a bit like the recycling bin in the actual experiment window. 
So I had to get rid of the two objects uh, permanently. Uh, so when we go to our main object, we will get permanently removed. Something else I'm going to do before we start creating the experiment is go to the custom tab on our object and enable the option that says offer rename new item immediately. Now every time we drag an item into the experiment, if we don't give it a name straight away, it will come out as a default name. If you get to that uh, red notes section down here, this will be an underscore item. If you drag a third one in, it will be an underscore underscore item. And uh, you have to basically go into each object and then give it a name time. That can get a bit uh, tiresome, so I'm going to select the option to offer rename new item immediately. And this basically means that whenever we put an object into the experiment, for example in step 10, we'll get a little dialog box that says offer rename new item. And it's quite nice to actually have that. The other thing I'm going to do before we get started on creating the experiment is click on the new experiment option. This contains some basic properties that we need to know about the experiment. The first thing I can do is actually give our experiment an initial name, so it's not a new experiment anymore. So if I click on that, I now have an option for it to change its name to new experiment. A couple other things I can also change. I could change the back end if I wanted to. Um, now the back end are basically the way that the Bin Reaction presenter takes it in. Essentially, Open Sesame takes your ideas about what the experiment should be doing and tells another package exactly what that package should do. It's that other package that's actually displayed underneath the experiment. By default, on this particular version of Open Sesame on uh, OS X, it's defaulting to this button here. Um, once again, you'll have to change that uh, in later. However, it's worthwhile checking the prompt guide on our website, and you can search for it on the different properties that it uh, has. There's some advantage to each style, and I'll give you some examples of those later. But you'll get a sense of what uh, the back end looks like. The other thing I want to do is going to going to change the resolution of our experiment here. By default, it's set to 1024 by 768. Uh, I'm going to actually set it to the uh, screen resolution of the other object that we just set up. So uh, 12 by 12 is the uh, default resolution. There we go. And the other thing I also want to change are the colours. The default is that I have a white foreground and a black background. So a white colour is the default colour for this uh, experiment. So I'm just going to select my rolls here so I can have a black colour appearing on the rolls. And that's all I'm going to change uh, in this uh, particular experiment. There we go. I'm also going to save the experiment now and click on OK. Let's see what happens. Okay, so if we look over at the overview area, you can see we've got the feature Catch Object ready and then a single feature which is Experiment. What we want to do is place our experiment onto that Experiment feature. Now if we think back to the diagram we drew earlier on where we had three objects uh, in the list with uh, instructions uh, at the top followed by the Experiment object followed by the Catch function. What we basically want to do is recreate that flow construction initially within this external window. To do that, I'm going to need to display some text on the screen somehow. Uh, I then need to have a list of trials that will help me uh, create the experiment. And then I need to have a, some other text which will uh, help me uh, display the text that's very often shown uh, in the presenter's message. There's multiple ways we can display text on the screen. Uh, the most obvious way is to use the uh, text display Now this particular uh, plugin is no longer active in develop, um, so it's actually got the status of being sort of a, a, a performer of the experiment. But I can drag it in and say that it's not really going to do much for the user. We get this deprecating uh, uh, form uh, cycle that reflects that it's not going to actually do anything. For that reason, I'm actually going to use uh, the performer of the experiment to actually uh, do it. Like that. Um, the form icon is what the user As you saw just a moment ago, I can just pick up the object and drag it into the overview window. So there's a second way that I can add objects to the experiment, and it's by clicking on the feature and then selecting 
can either adjust the icon up here or we can apply a diagonal tool. I'm going to use the pen view icon and select the short and long icon and then click OK. Now I have to name it immediately because we are uh, expecting to offer um, a diagonal new name and we've got the people to create them. So Now what the uh, form text render object will do is it'll display some text on the screen, but it won't actually create any input or feedback. What we really want to happen is, is the text to be displayed on the screen and then for Ableton Software to put their weight on the text itself and actually give us a diagonal text itself. What we can do here to achieve this is add a new icon and we can add a keyboard response button. And basically what's going to happen here with the keyboard response is that Ableton Software will hit this text object and then create this widget to feed back into the widget that we've created in the form text render object itself. So if I select that and hit OK, give it a name again. I'm going to call this one Face Response. And the reason I'm calling it Face Response is we're going to set it up so it only displays the face. Therefore, in the interaction with the result, I can say press the Face button to bring the face to life. And I can see that Face Response is inert and I can hit that button to stop it. So that first little box is now completed of the diagonal text itself. We can just say face and expression and it's done our second text response. Next thing we need to do is add in uh, something called a payment or a child. And we add child in using the loop function. Click on the plus to add that in. And we get another dialog box that comes up that asks us that, uh, well, a loop needs another item to run. So it's usually a feature. So I can actually create the item here by selecting the plus button. I'm actually just going to create a new item that's going to be a new feature. Uh, so that's going to be an experimental item. So if I press on 11, it will create another item to run. And then click on the plus button. And that will create an item that will rename the loop and pop it back into the form text render object. So that will rename it to sequence. We'll call it will run through our main experiment then we need to display the text result at the end so i'm going to do that exactly the same sort of way as i did with the instruction and i'm going to create a new item again which i'm going to call short text render and we're just going to give goodbye and goodbye widget and then i want to add in another one of these face response things to the widget which i can either hit the goodbye message at the end for until the result is back to the plus button which is what we did with the response and uh, I'm actually going to use the face now as well. So what, instead of creating a new object, I can actually append an existing item that I've used already. And I can say face response. Click on the tick. And that adds in a second property of the face response. It's a good time to point out here, actually, that when you do use objects in this particular way, if you change one instance of an object, it'll actually change both instances. So keep that in mind. If you change one and a reused object, it will change all other occurrences of that object as well demonstrate that in a minute as well. So we've got the general structure of our experiment here. So we've got the instructions, the weight of the feature. We run our main experiment and we get the goodbye widget message and then we can hit OK. So let's uh, set some basic information to the side so we can see how this works. So we click on instructions, text render and we get some messages and we can read them through here. set up so the exact same thing there but for a goodbye message and there it is next thing to do is set up this face response just to make sure that this object is hit by a weight and then we can hit OK if we look we look inside the face response object we can time out the text in instance so we can hit that in instance here with it and if we want to just compress the face there in order to use our instruction selector to get the uh, goodbye message. So what we can do is we allow the state to happen separately from the text there. Uh, we can use something called the speed switch command if we want to. But you can find out what all of these tools are by clicking on them and then clicking on the uh, command button. Obviously, 
probably would have kept me um, uh, as a free copy of it, but it was uh, there's no point in having it now. Well, the one I edited was with one Kennedy and Lee Scott, which I think I think I'm right in doing today, and do it all again and put a fresh one in. So I'm pretty sure it'll be the same kind of thing. If I change this one down here. reused objects and just sort of change them and put them back in. In fact, that's a quite a powerful feature to say, right, I'm going to use this object and put it back in and put it back in and put it back in. So we have to give this a chance to run now, don't we? So I think I'll run it once more. I'll get onto the subject line and then I'll um, run it once more. So and there we go. There's our instruction entered. Space bar. Of course, if you have a key, you can make it happen. Press the space bar. There we go. Get straight to the main page of the key. Give it a try. Let's go for it. So that was the uh, basic structure for the instructions, but uh, let's go run it again quickly just to check out what's happened. If we look at the instructions here, they're all located in the top left-hand corner. Um, you might want to have a title in there like Welcome to Chapter 88, or Command and Tab. Uh, and actually, you might want something pending on the screen um, here. So I've actually put a user in here to say that it's Welcome to Chapter 88 or something. But I'm going to hit out of the experiment now by pressing the Escape key. If I go into the instructions now, and what I can do in here is actually use some basic HTML formatting to make the text appear quite large. <laughs> so actually I want to make the text slightly larger. So let's try it again. And I'm going to try and put the text in bold. Next thing I want to do is actually make my text centered. And the way we actually do this is actually a little bit more hidden. So what we actually have to do is just go into this button down here, which allows us to add it to the upper left. So if I click on that, this is basically the page that's being run on the display when I have my text up on the screen. And right down at the very bottom here, we have this thing called widget zero zero three one label center HTML. If I change that no to a yes, that will now be centered on top of the main screen. now got a uh, Welcome to Chapter 88 experiment is now bold text and slightly larger than the rest of the page. And it's also now in the uh, top left hand corner. So I'll press the space bar and we'll get the text on the screen and it'll be on the top left hand corner. our global structures and our experiment design. What we need to do now is actually define the client themselves and also define the client procedure. So let's go for that again and put some text in. I'm going to do the latter first because it's basically that client that actually runs it already. So I'm going to click on the char sequence sequence object and basically just add in that particular sequence um, as a basic HTML file. Uh, the first thing I want to add in is a fixation dot, so I'll find it in the list here. In. We get asked to rename it, so I'm just going to leave it as this default because it's just a stuff that tells the server what it wants to uh, achieve. And we also want to pass in our uh, name. After we've presented the fixation dot, the next thing we need to do is present the client screen. Now, there's multiple ways you can actually go about doing this, but I'm actually going to use a, a website we've already been using a lot now, which is the text render website. It's very handy in text init mode because you have no text to actually render as well. So go down to the text render object, and I'll add that in. I'm 
to the food is good. Now let's watch the video and then we'll come back to it. Now of course in the instructions and the goodbye message I had to use that keyboard shortcut to note down the fact that wait until the food is served. Similarly we have to make sure that that will wait here as well otherwise the blank screen or the blank screen will take too much time. To do that I am going to use a without delay switch and add that into the experiment and I'm still appearing with a delay of 500. So that gives it a minute to load so I can have the delay of 500 milliseconds. So let's just get back to that timeline. The next thing you want to do is that display the picture in the text area of the picture. So to display pictures I use the sketch pad. Drop the sketch pad, add that in and I'm going to call it picture underscore subject. Just like the instructions and the goodbye message we need to basically get the response from the camera as well. So the capstone, pi uh, capstone sketch area is the display the picture in the text area but it won't actually search for anything in the keyboard. So what we need to do is add in another keyboard to stop that. So drop the sketch pad for a second, add that in and then separate the camera so that we're aware of what we're dealing with in the picture we want. And the final thing we need to do is after the picture has made a response we need to add uh, an icon that indicates what we've done but we want it to write the data to script. And to do that, I use the command key red key. So we can start it again. And it will have a note in the red key to get through. It's worthwhile pointing out at this point actually that whilst we're using WebSwitch uh, and we uh, could be used to it for many parts of the experiment, reusing the logs in WebSwitch is pretty much random. If we create a new different log in WebSwitch which each time you have a different sequence, your data file becomes part of it in memory. Uh, so it's a good idea to always have the camera the same distance of every icon that might be required to start it. So that's our sequence data set up. Now what we need to do is set up the packaging to start it. So let's start with the fixation dot. Click on that. And we want this to be on the screen for uh, 500 milliseconds. So change the duration to 500. The foreground color inherited it from the main experiment setting where the foreground color was the fact that the picture was white and not the camera rolling. And that's all because we want to make it a bit closer to that. So if we change the scope to 500 milliseconds and then we want to change the color to subject, which is a blank corner text render. By default we get your message in here, so I need to delete my camera. This is basically I'm going to render no text at the moment. When we delay, we want uh, open sessions to sit there and wait for 500 milliseconds, so change the duration. So I want delay to be 500 milliseconds. And then we get uh, actually presenting the picture on the text screen itself. By default, sketch pad has a duration of two seconds. Now the problem with this is that if we just leave it to two seconds, we're not actually going to get the full amount of response. Uh, instead, instead of the sketch pad waiting for sketch pad, we actually want the keyboard response to occur to wait. The way we do that is we specify the duration as being 0 milliseconds. Essentially, this basically means for open session is run the subject, display whatever you need to display on it, so the actual icon, and then move the subject, and in this case we'll move the duration to 500 milliseconds as well. So that's the duration set up. We'll actually put the picture with the text data onto the screen. Let's zoom in a bit. Uh, we need to click on the image tool and find the center of the screen. It's nice to scribble lay out here, so I'm going to click here to reveal the image in the center of the screen. And that brings up the star tool window. As mentioned earlier on, uh, we can actually add pictures down to the center of the chart, so I'm just going to place them into the star tool. And it is quite nice to see that uh, the subject is now actually drawn into the center of the star tool grid. Uh, I'm using the text pad to switch it from a normal to a normal render. What I'm going to do here now is add in all the captions and pictures that we're going to use in the uh, study by clicking on print. So in the drop down folder I have the captions and pictures and there they are. They're named uh, F01 to F72, that's the MP, the female cat, MA1 and the 1.5 to 1.7 male cat. 
that thing that I put in my my notebook is my very last one. I'll just try and put one there on the side here. What is cool here is you select any of, of any of these pictures. Uh, it doesn't matter which one because you're actually going to come back to this one here um, in another time when you can save it because it's it's sort of saved as a separate picture. So we'll just select and save that and come to it um, here. The next thing is to check out um, the keyboard, the keyboard response subject, keyboard response. Correct response is something that you need to keep an eye on every single time. So that's something you're going to have to come back to and, and, and find these things. But I can set up at the moment the allow me section. Uh, it will allow me to put things that I actually have read and thought out in the allow me response. So when you specify those two keys that you need to press, um, it will come to you in the morning and set it up and then demonstrate it. Up in the end, it'll actually switch to the fact that any other key apart from that uh, will actually affect the keyboard response subject that I need to put in there in order to make it work. Finally, in features that we have, the logger icon, by default, Print control automatically detects a novel variable. Personally, I tend to leave it on. It does mean that your data file is going to be quite extensive and contain a lot more strings than it should. So it does need to leave it on. So I think I'll leave it on for now. Next thing we need to do is actually check our file size. And to do that, um, we actually need to check our file size. The new subject has four main items that we need to set up. Uh, as to say what item we want to run. Well, we want to run the star system. However, um, I'll just change the width of this so I can read it without clicking. Uh, next up, up here is the title. It's set to one at the moment. This should basically refer to how many files that we're going to have in this new section. Uh, we've got 40 caps on the system, so we're going to have 40 stars. And there we go, we can now see that this uh, this one down here has got 94 caps on it. Now, that's the setting. The order is going to be random, which is uh, a good idea for our selection. And repeat is set to each time that it's checked. We can actually change this to apply two times. Basically, what this will do is the star system will be checked 40 times for you and it will run uh, all the time that it's checked once. And there we go. That's it. So we have 40 caps one time. Basically, 40 stars is what we're looking for. We now need to specify our variable. On each file, it gives you a certain number of items that will be different. So the most obvious one is going to be that each star is going to have a different caps on it. So that's going to look a little bit different. We also have a different uh, response we need to set. So it's a female cat, which is one keyboard response, which is an M. A male cat, which is actually a capital Z, which is a capital M. So I'm going to add those variables in by clicking on the Add variable. Get us an add variable name, obviously followed by the default value. I'll typically call this one F name, which is going to respond to the uh, corresponding file name that this is using. So that's F star, which is the F name, so we'll call it F name for now here. And I'm going to add another variable in called CL, which is actually for our cat. This is going to hold the values that the keys that this system should have in order to get back to its entire address. The next thing to do is actually populate this uh, mini spreadsheet here with all the cells. So there. They're all our cells for files. It's worth entering the file name and also entering what we've got for the actual cells. So we have a male cat, a female cat, a male cat, a male cat, a male cat, a male cat a Z, uh, and a female cat. Now, what we can now do is actually go back to our file procedure and actually insert some of this information in to make it look like it's actually a cell. So there's the cat face object. Now this, at the moment, is just displaying this one particular cat face, and basically if we run this experiment, what will happen is we will always get this one particular cat face turned up. What we actually want is the fact that we need to change the cat face to actually get the total cat that we're currently on. So essentially what we're going to have to do is on each file, go back to this particular list here, pull out what's either in the F name column for that particular cell, so let's say if it's writing on cell number six, we want it to pull out ma6.bmp and insert that into the section where we've got variable name uh, for the particular cat face that we have here. The way we do that is by right clicking on the F star picture here and select edit and it brings up here the project action tool result. I actually make quite a lot of sense with that drawer because it's actually drawing an image of the real drawer which is actually the, the file name there, the cell, the center, the 
and all that. So what we can do here is en uh, edit the file name, um, fo1.bmp, and then we can look for this file name, and it's that bit that you're going to load up, so we'll just click OK. And we can actually tell the compressor to go back to that column called fo and find out what fo file name it should be, so we'll just click OK. The way we do that is we put the variable name, fname, and then close it with a square bracket. This basically is very telling our compressor unit to go back to that loop area, look for the variable called fname, and pull out whatever bin that particular file is in, should it be found in there. So let's say it's in here. What it basically means is that we put the compressor back to the code, and everything is there, because the value of fname has changed in that particular file. When I click on OK, what the chat face has now disappeared, and we've got no compressor. One object is not there because it's been found in that file. The next I need to change is going to be in the text font. We can now specify what the correct font should be. Just like defining what the chat face picture should be, we want this compressor to go back to the this pullout chat unit CR text. So we'll specify it exactly the same way. CR, we indicate it's a variable. we go. We should now have a working experiment that can express 40 pictures of chat faces in six prints and an order um, of 1 a.m. when I think it's now recording the chat face. Oh, I think that's not very good. Let's give that a go. Let's see what we get. One comma three. We have to indicate a chocolate number. So we're not running the experiment for real. We can actually have a chocolate number present here. There we go. So we've got the chat face of the experiment. We've got there, detail, front of body, and we're going to press space bar to get started. Let's have a look at the chat. There we go. That is a simple experiment um, in seconds. This final section of this experiment is going to have a look at something slightly a little bit more advanced, and that is how we can actually use composition uh, to specify what a certain object or chat face should look. In particular, the reason for adding this um, is that you might often want to give feedback to your own experiment to say whether it's found in there or not. In this particular example, if I go back to the chat detail or the events here, uh, after we display the chat face, it's just made a response. I'd like to indicate to the compressor whether they got the file right or wrong. Now, if we always say something in six prints, uh, six prints of sound, six prints of everything in sound, they'll get annoyed quite quickly. But quite often, experiments will have a tone or a message indicating they got the file wrong. Uh, usually, it's something to do with sound quality. So in this particular example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a sound to say this picture, did they get the file wrong? So the way we do this is we have to uh, add some more objects into the chat unit. But we need to add one object into the chat unit. Depends on your item, you need to add a sound to it. So I'm going to call it plus. And I'm going to call it, uh, the reason it will come up is later, your Now at the moment, it's just been writing to various ANs in the procedure. Um, it can actually sit there and make the composition look different, but I'm going to actually make it so it's straight after the chat response uh, or the chat event, and just demonstrate how you move objects about. You're literally just picking them up and moving them around in the chat script. So let's have it straight after the chat response, and then click on the object here to specify So I only specify what the sound file is, and I'm going to browse for it. It broke the file tree, as per usual. Uh, there's not many sounds in here yet, so I need to add one. And I'm going to add a comment saying that I want the chat face to look like this. Okay. So I will add a comment here, and I will select it. Now, because we're going to say the same uh, chat CR and the same chat face got the file wrong, I don't specify that, I just specify the variable here, and I'm going to call it uh, chat. Um, 
volume will be at 100 percent so uh, it's also specified whether you want to stop the fire after a certain period um, or to phase in the fire it's also how long it should be so the full switch down is based on what the fire is going to be and uh, that's what we'll set up now so we'll go back to the fire speaker what we have to do now to run the study is that people say to me right hand side can i scan it off always that basically means i'm going to get the tap now and i'm going to watch the switch itself because it's always going to be on yeah um regardless of whether the fire is going or not right what i want to do is find out some way of phase bombing properly run if they get on fire right so the way we do that is we have to look at the tap response and see whether they actually get the tap signal or not right so we can use the guardian tap the whole tap is on so we'll tap there and we'll tap a little bit further and we'll tap at 643 over here so if you look up here it says uh, correct tap response um, value will depe depend upon the response of course so I should run the tap and I'll get the right tap so how will it switch in the item tap response so it's referring to this particular the thing that I need to note is this correct tap response. Basically, what this object here, the uh, tap response, is a correct tap response. So we go back here and we ba basically say run if, and remember that these are variables because this is a square bracket, run if correct tap response variable equals zero. Now we've got our object tap there as well. So if we wanted to tell the tap fire when the object tap fire is right, It's a good point to check out here that when you start running the experiment, you're normally asked to run the object fire at the same velocity as the tool. Uh, so that's that's the best way. Okay. So here we go. This is our the responses again. So we'll start when we do the experiment. Now that one I do know is an error tap. So I'm going to get this one right. So I'm going to tap the red key. Red there. This one is also an error tap. But I'm just going to get this far wrong and press F to see that I get this error tap I get right. This is also an, an error tap, so I get this fire wrong again. Here we go. And this is also an error tap, so I get error tap again. Tap the switch again. Okay. So that's an easy way that you can do a speed check, a switch check. 